All right, everybody. Well, welcome to the Seeing Ability podcast, where we're having a discussion about the world of people with disabilities. And that means we're going to be talking with adults who grew up as that person with a disability, with parents who are raising kids with disabilities, and a lot of the different people involved in supporting this community. We're going to be talking to medical professionals. We're going to be talking to folks in education and folks working with the amazing nonprofits that support this community. I'm your host, Jim Littlefield Dalmaris, and I know you have a lot of choices when it comes to podcasts, so we really appreciate you tuning in with us today. Um, And I've got a really exciting guest that I think you're going to enjoy meeting. So Brad, Michelle is with me today. Brad, welcome to the program. Thank you, Jim. I'm I'm, uh, very proud to be here and very honored. And I've got, most of you are listening to this podcast, but those of you who are watching it on YouTube, you're noticing I've got a different hat on today. We're going to get to that in a minute, but you know, before we get into this journey and this world of people with disabilities, we're all just people, right? That's the first part of people with disabilities. And so we always like to start off with the fast four, get to know our guests a little bit on a personal level. Now, we're lucky that the fast four is brought to us by the folks at Reliable Tech Help. So for all your IT needs, call Reliable Tech Help there at 502-797-7399 or reliabletechhelp.com. Now that's tech with a K, not C-H. Brad, are you ready for the fast four? I'm ready. All right. Number one, tell us what is your favorite junk food? Favorite junk food. Uh, My big, my weakness and my favorite is going to be any kind of shake. I mean, like any kind of blast from like Sonic or Dairy Queen or anything like that. Yeah, I'll go. And I I don't go for the little one. I go for the big one. Definitely any kind of shake. A lot of listeners that can relate to that. Okay. Number two. What is your favorite show or streaming show? What's kind of your uh, guilty pleasure that you're watching? Maybe staying up watching episodes more than you should. So my favorite stream, I don't get a lot of time to stream things. Um, I'll start and stop things. I mean, I've probably started like three or four shows. But the, the last one that I really enjoyed was Ozarks. Ozarks was one that I actually watched from beginning to end. And it was, I don't know, it just really, everything about it was just really great. Yeah, it's got got a kind of addictive quality to it, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It, it, it does. It, it wants it, it leads you. I wanted. I want. I hope they have a sequel. Let's put it that way. So, if we were to look at a playlist, and we'll be talking about an activity you're doing uh, right now that probably has a lot of songs going on, what would we find on your playlist? Um, I think you know I'm a big country music fan, so I like uh, Morgan Wallen. He's uh, he's pretty you know pretty hot artist right now. He's kind of taken over country radio. And there's a song, it's not one of his new songs, it's an older song, and it's called Cover Me Up. And uh, it's almost like a, uh, it's just a nice, just, I mean, just, you could feel every word that he says, you could put yourself in that position. And a lot of his music does that. You can just, he's been through a lot and you can kind of feel his music. And I, I really appreciate that about him. Yeah, I love that connection to the song. And then last but not mm-hmm. least, if we were to able to just whisk you away to a favorite getaway destination, where would it be? Oh, okay. <laughs> and this has been, I've had this spot on my radar since I was probably about 15, 16 years old. Uh, by, by no doubt, uh, Tahiti. Tahiti's my place. Yeah. Okay. I might go and not come, I might not come back. <laughs> you guys all heard yeah. it here, Tahiti. So there you go. Brad, Tahiti. Tahiti, we're putting it out in the universe, right? That's it. I love it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about kind of your origin story as a father how did you get, uh, tell us a little bit about your story, about your son, Jacob, and kind of how you got in this world. All right, perfect. So I, I'd like to bring you back to, I was single until I was about 40 years old, and I never thought I would have children. I, I, I think in my mid-30s, I was just like, it wasn't going to be part of my life. Um, I was, you know, just a selfish single guy, and I never thought kids would kind of play out into my world. So, but when I moved to Nashville about a year into it, I met my lovely wife. Uh, she swept me off my feet and she had a daughter um, that was 10 years old. And, and as soon as you know, she made me a dad right away, um, even though she's a stepdaughter, she's anytime you have a daughter, it really softens you up right away. And, and, and being a single guy for that long, it really helped me evolve. But Jamie and I did get pregnant right away. We're excited. I, I remember having a conversation with her while we were dating. And I, I kind of tested the water a little bit. I said, you know, how do you feel about having another child? And secretly knowing that I wanted to have a child. And she was like, yeah, I would do, I can, I would do that. And three months later, we were married. So um, when we went through that process, we got you know, pregnant really, really quickly. 
And I just, I mean, I, I had to pinch myself. She brought a plate out from a restaurant and says, you're going to be a dad. And I, I could still remember that feeling, that tingling feeling at, you know, at that restaurant. But as we went through the pregnancy, she, you know, I didn't miss an appointment. I didn't miss an ultrasound. I was there for every single one. Um, this was, I mean, this was the world to me. And we found out it was a boy, you know, early in the genetic testing and the amazing things that they do now with that. And when I found out it was a boy, I was like, it was a dream come true. It was like, you know, I'm going to, I got that first boy and, you know, he's, I'm going to teach him all the things that I know and then teach him what not to do. And just, I already had his, I started planning. And as we went through the pregnancy, uh, the, the typical baby room would be blue, um, you know, dinosaurs or, you know, baby elephants and things like that. Well, I went a little different route. I had a uh, sports team room. I mean, it almost looked like a man cave and nice. it looked like some, like a 25 year old's bedroom, but it had all kinds of, you know, pictures and this and that football, baseball, all things Nashville. Um, so you might've been just was, a little bit, just a little bit excited, <laughs> right? I, I was, oh, I mean, just, I woke up every morning and just, I can't wait. I can't wait. I can't wait. And then uh, when we went into, when we went in to have Jacob, it was like a six, eight hour process. And I videoed the whole thing. I wore, I wore my own scrubs in. Um, I had a, uh, I had one of the, the doctor's hats on and put the mask on and videoed the whole thing. And, you know, Jamie was going through different things. They were trying different things to make sure that he was going to come out naturally. And I sat next to the little heartbeat machine because that, that part makes me very nervous about the heartbeat. So I sat next to the heartbeat machine and then, you know, six or eight hours later, Jacob came into the world. Fantastic. And then, so tell me about his development and where you started to notice that there might be some things not going according to plan. So when I, when Jacob was born, I mean, everything was perfect. Everything checked out. You know, we got to take him home right away. And I remember taking that slow drive home. It was raining. So I was doing like 12 miles an hour all the way. I, I didn't believe they let you take a child home at that with that, you know, even in the palm of your hand. And I was very nervous. Um, I was there, held him through, you know, through the first, you know, two weeks. Anytime Jamie didn't have him, I had him. And, you know, it was just a beautiful thing. It was it was God's gift to me. And, and you know, it, it, just, it was everything that I could ever possibly imagine. But at the probably around three to six months, um, Jamie, who had already had a child, noticed some things that Jacob wasn't doing, like the eye contact, like when we were changing his diaper, he didn't look at us. And she noticed that. And then I was like, oh, you know, I totally blew it off. Didn't I had never had a child, so I didn't have anything to compare it to. So I just said, oh, that, no, that's fine. You know, it's he's OK. And at nine months or so, there was a couple of milestones that he wasn't hitting. Um, he wasn't responding to his name. He wouldn't play peekaboo. Uh, just some really simple things that we noticed or my wife noticed. And then my mother-in-law actually stepped in it when he was about one. And she goes, you know, I think Jacob might be autistic. And I got angry and I told Jamie, I was like, I don't want her at my house anymore. I was like, I don't want her anywhere around Jacob. I said, if she's going to bring that kind of evil into my home, I mean, that's how angry I was. Cause mm -hmm. I had never, it was a furthest thing from my mind. I was like, well, how does she know that he's one years old? There's no way you can tell at one years old. And so I went through that emotions and I blew her off. I was like, there's no, this is Jacob. Okay. This is my Jacob. He's going to play football. I'm going to be the dad in the stand saying, that's my son. He's going to go to a big college. I mean, all these different things. And as you know, so year, year and a half went and he was still not talking, missing some milestones. And at that point I promised Jamie said, listen, I think we should get him tested. We should get him diagnosed. And I said, no, but we did, we did start therapies. And she said, okay, can we start therapies? Cause I was still in denial. I was still in denial year and a half denial. I said, he's just a little behind. And it, he was born during COVID or right on the beginnings of COVID. So no preschool or not preschool, but no daycare. Okay. So he was at home all the time. So, you know, I said, oh, he's just delayed. Cause he's not around other kids. He's not getting that exposure. So that's part of the problem. And I said, he'll be fine. Let's let's let he'll grow out of it. And when he hit that two year mark, I promised her that if if he wasn't hitting those milestones that we would get him diagnosed. And at the two year mark, he was still very behind in, in certain areas, still not talking, his eye contact, 
you know, that interaction that you're looking for was still not there. So at that point, we started looking into a diagnosis. So what once you got a diagnosis, kind of a little bit more about what was going on, tell me kind of how that sort of rocked your world a little bit. It it didn't it didn't affect me right away. I, you know, I started, you know, I was I was on the Google train, right? I just started Googling everything about my only exposure to autism at that point was the movie Rain Man. That was the only that was my only definition of what autism was or, or autistic. And because it was actually one of my favorite movies, I'm a big Tom Cruise fan. And so I didn't, pro- I just started Googling. I'm like, okay, you know, this and that, this, you know, cause he looked very normal or typical, you know, he didn't, it wasn't, he didn't have any extreme uh, difficulties. He just didn't, you know, didn't interact, didn't, you know, didn't talk um, pointed, but he communicated, but in his own way. So I had, you know, I, had high hopes. I was like, you know, he's going to grow out of this. He's going to be okay. In six months, we're not even going to remember this. And so as we went on uh, into that two, two and a half year mark, we waited on the diagnosis for about two to three months. And then we got lucky to get into um, a research study where they said, okay, if you let us film him being diagnosed, we'll diagnose him tomorrow. And so it was at Vanderbilt University. So we jumped on that to get him a diagnosis. And they go through and they just watch him play for about 20 minutes. And then she's like, okay, I'm going to give you an official evaluation, but not today. It's going to take about two weeks. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm like, I'm uh-huh. like, and I look at her and she looks back at me and I'm like, no, you're not going to, no, we're not going to do that. I, said, I looked at her in the eyes at that point. I said, I said, listen to a dad, what do you think off the record? And she goes, and she just shook her head. Yeah. And so that's what she, that's what she left me with. So we left the hospital that day, went home, still just, you know, looking at Jay, just hugging on him, loving on him. You know, we didn't treat him any differently. We, tr- we treat him just like a typical child. So two weeks later, we go back and that's when they hand you the papers, you know, the official, you know, official write up. And, you know, she, we get in this little room and she's like, you know, Jacob's autistic this and that. And they hand you a packet that says, this is what autism is. No instructions on what to do, no next steps, no nothing like that. Just here it is. And they, you know, they turn you out the door. So when Jamie and I walked downstairs, we probably sat in the car for about an hour and Mm -hmm. just, we just cried. I mean, I cried and cried and cried. And then when I stopped crying, I cried some more. I couldn't even drive home. She had to drive home and I, I, I could feel the anger starting to boil inside of me because I just felt so helpless in that moment. And then I, you know, I went into this blame game of why did you do this to me? Who did this to me? What did I do to deserve this? So, you know, the, the torment inside of me started at that point. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so one talk about how you kind of worked through those emotions and um, kind of what came next. So, after after that diagnosis, the initial diagnosis, you go home, you squeeze Jacob, and then you're like, okay. My wife jumped on it right away. She was, I mean, she was my hero in the beginning of this. She jumped on it. She was emailing, telephone calls nonstop, doing that. She's very good at that, and you know, in that in that realm um, of communication. And at that point, I just did everything I could to to function. I mean, that's how, that's how low I got. I mean, I mean, I couldn't focus on work. I cried. I cried. Um, you know, I'm a very faithful, I'm a very spiritual man. And, you know, I, I yelled at God and I was that upset. I said, you know, as faithful as I've been, you know, I, I changed my life, gave myself to, you know, gave myself to Jesus. And this is how, you know, what are you repaying me for? What are you doing to me? And that's, that was the anger and the fight that I went through initially. And then, as Jamie started to do some work and we started getting to therapies and we started getting, you know, in in different programs and things, you know, I was there in in person. I was there in flesh, but I wasn't there. I was still involved. I was still, you know, going to the appointments, going to, you know, whatever it is I needed to do to make sure that I facilitated um, the process, but I wasn't there. Um, I still changed diapers. I still put him to bed, but I, I mean, I was empty on the inside. And, and every time I looked at Jacob, I still remember every time I looked at him, this, this boiling point came to me. And I was just like, 
who and why did some someone took Jacob away from me and I, I wanted to find out who or why, you know, and that was just, and that's just an honest answer as a dad. I, I was like, all those expectations, all those plans that I had selfishly for myself just went away. They all went away because I started looking, you know, you know, what is the expectation? And they're like, it's very limited, you know, and not just now it could be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And it just, I couldn't, I, I, I just couldn't process it. And that, you know, I just couldn't. I'm curious to know, because a lot of times in this work, I'll end up talking with moms a lot. You know, when you think of parenting uh, in a lot of cases, moms kind of take the lead. And especially when you think of raising a kid with special needs, a lot of times it's conversations with moms. Um, What about your reaction to this? Do you think is helpful for our audience to know is unique to the guy's perspective or or the dad's perspective, man of the house kind of thing, all those things, um, your journey through it as, as a man. Well, like I shared before, you know, it was going to be my boy, you know, it was going to be Jacob was my boy. I I wasn't even going to share him with anybody at that point. You know, this is going to be, this is dad's boy. And, but I'm a very hands-on dad. I'm very hands-on. Like, and it, like I said, I didn't miss an appointment. I change all, I'm a diaper changer. I'm, I'm not afraid. I there do all go, those like things. It. I make, yeah, I make bottles. I do all that. I think that's important. I think it's important sometimes as a dad to be as, be involved as much as you can at an early age. Um, I know traditionally it's all right. Mom takes care of him, right. Gets him through those first years, you know, especially if you're, you know, if you're breastfeeding and, and things like that. Um, and then dads take over, right. At the three or four or five year mark. Okay. You know, starts playing sports and starts doing that. Then, then he's daddy's boy, but Jacob was mine from the beginning and I was very emotional with him. And from, you know, from a man's perspective, after he was diagnosed, I, I, I couldn't understand why I couldn't take the autism away from him as a father. When something happens to your child, you know, if he scrapes his knee, dad fixes it. You know, if, if your child's being bullied at school, dad, you know, goes to the school and and finds out what's going on. If Jacob needed a, if Jacob needed a kidney or a heart, I could give it to him. But Jim, in the world of autism, I can't take it away. And I think that was the hardest thing as a dad, because dads fix things. Dads fix things. That's what dads do. We fix the problem. You know, we fix the toilet, we fix the sink, you know, we fix the garage but I couldn't fix this and I couldn't understand why. And, you know, I asked God to take it away from him, give it to me and all those different things. So as a man, it was very difficult, especially when we started, when she was doing that process of the paperwork and things like that, I didn't know how to treat Jacob. I was like, can I still, you know, can I still teach him things? Can I still do things with him? Um, You know, on a, on a dad level. Um, you know, let's go play in the garage. Let's, you know, use your building blocks. Let's, you know, do those different games. But when I tried to do those things, there wasn't a response from Jacob. I mean, even trying to read a book with him, uh, he wouldn't sit still. He would just move away and go on to something else. So that part really hurt was those dad games that I wanted to play. And then, you know, sensitivity wise, sensory issues. I didn't know if I could wrestle with him, throw him around a little bit. Yeah. He kind of got freaked out if I picked him up, you know, a little too high. He wasn't fragile, but there was, there was, you know, there was some hesitation in him. Yeah. So all those games and all those dad things that you, you know, typically you would have, I didn't have those things. And it just didn't, it didn't help my situation. It did not help how I was feeling. Cause I was looking for a band aid or a cure of something to help me do that. And then, the, you know, and the hardest part was when I did go out and I saw other dads with their sons you know, mm-hmm. at, the, at, at Jacob's, at Jacob's age. And I remember this specifically, I would go up to dads with their, with their boys and ask them specifically, how old's your son? And they would tell me, Oh, he's two, he's one and a half. He's doing this. And, and, and the little boy would be talking, he'd be walking with his dad, they'd be throwing the ball together. And he was the same age as Jacob. And I found myself doing that all the time. And every time I did it, it was just like another sword in me. It was another sword. It was another sword. So it, it, you know, as a man, I mean, it just, I mean, it, it, I mean, it broke me down. I mean, it really did. I mean, just, it collapsed my world for a long time. Yeah. Any advice for um, our women listeners about kind of how to be there and help their partner 
screwed things like this at, at, from the man's perspective and, and kind of maybe come to terms with those emotions and then learn a way to become at peace with them and kind of get to moving on from them. Any, any thoughts on that looking back? I do. I do. Um, you know, the one thing I think that helped me the most, you know, cause it was, you know, I think I'm looking back probably several months and when I say several, I mean, probably three to four months where I was very distant, you know, distant from my wife. Um, you know, our, it, it affected our marriage. It, it affected our intimacy. Um, because it just, there was, I was, you know, checked out, um, in, in that department, but, what I think would help the most if I, you know, if I had to talk to other women would be al- allow your man to be vulnerable, hmm. allow him to be vulnerable because that will, that will help him heal and that'll help him open up to you. Um, Cause it's very hard because I think in, and this is just typically speaking, men are the leader of the house, you know, men are the ones, you know, they don't cry. Um, they never waver. They, you know, they fix everything and they're the, you know, they're the one you look up to. But when things like this happen, I think if, if, from a woman's perspective, you allow your husband to be vulnerable and show him that it's okay. I think that's the biggest thing. Show him it's okay not to be super dad or be the leader and, and not cry and not, you know, show emotion, you know? And I remember Jamie just hugging me when I cried. And she allowed me to do that. She allowed me to do it. And she didn't, and when, when that happened, I didn't, I didn't feel that she felt less of me. And I think a lot of men are afraid that they'll, that their better half will make them feel less of a man um, when those moments happen. And so if you can allow your man to show his true feelings and, and, and just talk to him and, and have the friendship come out in your relationship, don't look at him as your husband, look at him as your friend. And yeah and have that kind of conversations with him and work together and let him know that he doesn't have to fix this alone. He doesn't have to do this alone. Um, you're going to walk with him. And I think that's, that's a big piece of it is, is just like, you know, marriage, you know, typical marriage is difficult. Um, you know, typical children are hard to raise. And so it's kind of, it's kind of the same mentality, but I think vulnerability is, it was my word that I found the most was because that's, that's a scary word for a man. You know, what does that, yeah. you know, what does that mean? What, uh, I don't, I'm not vulnerable. <laughs> I don't even, I don't, and, and it's very easy to say. And, and, but in, in, in my experience that helped me cope. It really did. And, and yeah. Jamie, my wife did it. She did an incredible job doing that. And she didn't make me feel any lesser. I still got the big piece of chicken, you know, after <laughs> it was all said and done. So. I appreciate you sharing that because yeah, there's not a lot of space for men to be able to admit they don't have it all together and they don't have all mm-hmm. the answers. So I appreciate that. So when you decided not only to look for services and support and help Jacob live his best life, you kind of had this motivation to go beyond that. So talk about that motivation and how that led to the work you're doing now with Jacob's Audible, that that bigger vision that you had. So when I you know, Jacob was diagnosed in September and it, it took, it took, I think at least till December is when I finally started to make some, some space, um, between, you know, getting out of where I was and it, it, it was on a daily basis, but it was, it was December of that, tw- that, uh, 21 where I was, I was like, all right, Brad, cause I'm, a, I'm a very competitive guy. I'm a very, um, you know, high energy guy. And so, to see me where I was, 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 you know, very unusual. And, and I had never been there before. Um, so I didn't really know how to get out of it. I mean, I've, I've dug some holes, but not, not as deep as this. And, but I was like, you can't, you know, I, I just told myself, um, you need to pick yourself up and you need to get out of this so you can advocate for your family, advocate for Jacob. And when I finally got out of that space and I started realizing, you know, the, the goodness and, and the, and the, the feeling I was having of, Hey, you know, I can, I can look at this differently. I can change the way I'm looking at this and, and help Jacob, you know, be the best and live his life to the fullest. But then I started looking around and when we, when you get out of that space and you start learning more and you start getting into other people who are, you know, in the same position you are, and you start talking to other families and people, you start realizing that you're not alone. One and our situation was not typical. Um, we had a lot of resources. 
we had a lot of help, you know, both, you know, both grandparents on each side, we had family help, um, you know, a two parent home. We had, you know, a sibling who was, you know, almost, you know, teenage age where she was able to help. Yeah. And that's not a typical situation. Um, we talked to a lot of parents, um, single moms, single dads, uh, a lot of, a lot of grandparents end up taking the child and, and, you know, in some instances, and I was like, I started getting, you know, I started getting floored on, wow. I'm like, you know, we, we need to get involved. I was like, we need to share our story, but also if, you know, we need to help people, um, you know, navigate through this situation because I know when we got the diagnosis, I mean, there was no next steps. Like Jamie created those next steps. She right. just learned on the fly and things, but she's incredible at that. I mean, that's, this is, I mean, this is, I mean, she worked in HR. She's a compensation accountant. I mean, this is the way she, this is her realm and her wheelhouse. And I know that's not for everybody. And so I started thinking how fortunate we were to have those things that we had. And when I started talking to the parents and started saying, oh yeah, we're doing this, we're doing that. They were like, we don't even know what that is. We don't even know that we weren't, we didn't even know that we were eligible for that. We don't even know where to start. So at that moment, I was like, we have to get involved. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, like I said, very spiritual, very faithful guy. And I'm, I, you know, I think God leads us to certain ministries um, in this lifetime. And you, you just not only, you know, him dragging me up from the bottom, but he also gave me a different purpose. And he said, okay, you know, cause he said, you know, this is what Jacob, you know, this is who Jacob is. Jacob is Jacob, but it's going to bring purpose to your life. And I'm going to show you how. And that's when I decided to change the play on autism and not just for myself, but for families with like situations and help them navigate through, you know, this world of uh, dealing with a uh, autistic child. I see you're tying it back to that football room after all, right? This audible concept. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's exactly what it was. So when I, when I, you know, I remember I, I turned to my wife, I said, you know, I think I'm going to start a nonprofit for Jacob. And she's like, um, go back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I go, no, really? She goes, and you know, cause you think starting nonprofit, we always think about the big nonprofits, right? Yeah. Susie B. Coleman, autism, you know, you think about the big nonprofits. Um, but I did a little bit of homework and I looked at it because I wanted to, I wanted to honor Jacob in a certain way. And I think this goes back to the dads again, is as a man, you know, I want Jacob to know that I'm his dad and, and dad's going to do everything he can to help you. Dad's going to be there, you know, and stand up for you. And I don't know how to do that. And I didn't know how to do that because he doesn't fully understand, you know, what we're doing now, but I know one day he will. And so I want to, I want to uplift his name. And, and that's where the name Jacob's Audible came from was not only to uplift him, but, it, you know, we decided to look at autism differently and change the way we, you know, I, especially myself, how I, you know, how I perceived it. I use the word audible because it's, it's the football term to change the play. And a lot of people, you know, I, you know, if you're not a football person, you're like, well, you know, I, I do a lot of explaining on that, but the audible also has a second meaning and it means to listen and it yeah. means to hear. And a lot of times, you know, majority of autistic children are nonverbal, but they do communicate very well. But also when you're talking to, you know, other parents and caretakers about their child, because, you know, every child is different, um, typical or non-typical, every child is different. Every family has a different story. So we need to listen and hear what they're saying. So that way we can help them navigate their particular situation and not just a blanket advice of do this, do that. This is going to work for you. So that's where the audible came in. So the change, the way we look at it, but also to listen and hear what's going on around us and, and, and take it from there. Absolutely. Now I'm wearing this four, four, four hat. You mentioned you're competitive. You mentioned you've got a lot of energy. You're on the second year now of doing something that I am going to say it's a little not typical for somebody to say, Hey, I'm going to do a, something big. I'm going to raise awareness, probably raise some funds, interact with people along the route. And you decided to walk, I think it's 30 days, 15 miles a day along the Natchez Trace. Last year, you're in the midst. We're recording this episode when you're like taking a break in the evening after a long day on the trail. 
Tell us about this idea, a little bit about last year, this year. How's it going? Where'd you get this idea to be out walking 444, 444 miles along this path? Yeah, Jim, it it's once again it was it was one of those middle of the night things. I when I decided to, to do the nonprofit, I was like, okay, well, and I started doing the research. I'm like, okay, this is it's gonna take money. <laughs> so I was like, all right, I, I need to find I need to figure out how to, you know, how to fundraise and how to and how, you know, what can I do to start it? Nobody knows who we are. Um, you know, you just don't raise your hand and say, Hey, you know, Jacob's Audible's here, donate. So I, I knew I knew I had to make a splash of some sort and I wanted to do something, you know, you know, something pretty significant. I just didn't know how significant it would be. So during COVID and uh, we used to just to get out of the house, we would drive to the Natchez Trace. Um, we would all get in a van um, and we would go down the Natchez Trace. It, it, it's about a mile. It ends about a mile away from where I live. So we'd go down five miles, turn around, come back. I really didn't know much about the the trace when I, you know, when I first thought of this idea, um, I didn't know that it was that long. Um, but I started looking at, you know, the tunnel for towers walk. Um, there's a man for St. Jude that walks across the country. And I was like, well, I can't do that. So, but <laughs> with the Natchez trace idea, I was like, all right, 30 days, 15 miles a day. You start thinking, okay, can I leave the house that long? Can I do this and do that? And then once again, I rolled over and asked my wife, I said, Hey, I'm going to walk the Natchez Trace for our nonprofit. She told me, go back to sleep again. Um, that was, <laughs> yeah, go back here. to sleep. Yeah, 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 go back to sleep. And, but I just started doing my own little research. And this is like February, March. So no lead time into last April. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it for Autism Awareness Month. I'm going to start, you know, looking at the lodging. I'm going to start making announcements locally in Bellevue. I was like, if I can touch the people locally in Bellevue, Nashville area, I think that'll give me enough support to, to take this thing on. And, you know, like I said, maybe five weeks of lead time, um, the, the local news picked it up. So I got a little bit of, you know, momentum that way. And then we just set forth and, and just started walking last year. And, and I had a great buddy who came with me, um, you know, that you got to have that person that picks you up and drops you off. I mean, without them, it doesn't leave your end. And we just came down and we just winged it. I mean, there's no other word I can use. We just yep. winged the whole trip and we just walked. We walked, we stayed in random hotels. Um, I mean, there, there's a story, you know, that I'll never forget. I just, I made a lot of videos. I did a lot of pictures um, just to, you know, get the Facebook momentum going, Instagram and things like that. Yeah. But, you know, when it was all said and done, it, I, it was going to be a one-time only thing. I mean, I thought, okay, I'm going to do this, make a splash, uh, you know, put this as something that'll go down and, you know, hey, dad, walked the Natchez Trace for me. And, and it was going to kick off Jacob's Audible. Well, it did that. We raised enough money to get incorporated. And so, you know, it was a success. And I was like, okay, so that's going to be it. Well, this past December, I started getting phone calls and text messages. And people were like, hey, you doing that walk again? Hey, you doing that yeah. walk again? I want to I want to be involved. I want to be involved. I love it. And so, yeah, so people started, you know, asking me, hey, what can we do this time? Can we Can we help? And I went to my wife. I said, hey. What do you think about me doing? No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, and 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 I want to share this with the audience. So, um, in twenty twenty one, and this is something I, I wanted to mention earlier. In the midst of Jacob's diagnosis, we had another child, and his name is Jackson. And so Jackson was born August thirtieth. Jacob was diagnosed September thirteenth. So when you talk about going from a high back down to a low, that was ultimately it. So we added Jackson um, in 2021. So now Jackson was young when I walked at the first time. Well, now Jackson's a little more of a handful and he's mobile. He's doing all these things. Um, just to share with the audience, Jackson has tested off the charts. Um, not nothing um, in, in the world of autistic at all. So mm -hmm. we're very grateful for that. Um, I think he's having a good positive influence on Jacob. They're starting to play together. They're starting to communicate together. So we really see great things with that. But coming up to this year now, from last year, like I said, it was just me, me, Tim, um, you know, everybody chipped in to help with the kids and everything while I was gone. But this year we have sponsors that helped out along the way. Um, I have an event coordinator, which I'm excited okay. about. Um, yeah, she took care of, I mean, 80% of the trip, lodging, 
Um, she set up different talking events and speaking events. We're actually touching the communities along the way, um, different autism therapies. Um, I'm doing a, a men's, uh, I'm actually talking to, to dads and fathers in Tupelo for the Shine, the, the Shine Foundation. We're holding an event there at a, at a big church. So, and I'm going to share my story with men um, and help them, you know, with that vulnerability is, is yeah. my big talking point. And, and yeah, so now, right now I'm in, I'm in day 12 of year two. Uh, we just got done with mile 180. Uh, and I, I was staying in a place that had no internet. So I had to drive back 30 minutes and, and I'm here with you now because I wouldn't have missed this for the world. And so, yeah, we're in day 12. We got 18 days to go. Um, we're in a little small town called uh, French camp. Um, it's got, it's a three street town, and, uh, <laughs> but, the, but the, the people are amazing. Um, I'm seeing some familiar faces from last year, but this trip looks very different because there's the purpose is different this year. Yeah. The purpose is more driven towards our message and our mission um, to share our story, share what we're doing and just show people to step out of that comfort zone. And then for other dads to, how I reversed it to now I'm going to step back into that leadership role. And I want my family and my wife and, you know, here's dad out here walking this highway for us and he's walking it for our family and he's walking it for Jacob. So my world 180, you know, in that, you know, in that, in that bottom of being emotional and vulnerable to now I'm, I'm back and have that confidence of being that leader and being the dad and the father that I want to be. Fantastic. Well, as you know, we try to keep our episodes tight I feel like I could talk to you and I'm sure most people could listen to you for like another couple hours, but we do need to wrap up. If folks want to learn more about your work, where can they go to learn about you? Even if they want to support you, where can they go? So we do have a great, great website. It's uh, Jacobs Audible, Jacob with an S. So jacobsaudible.org, O-R-G. If you accidentally accidentally put .com, it will redirect you to the right website. Uh, We do have great options on there if you would like to donate and get involved. We also have uh, a text to give. So if you want to text 444-253-555, that'll lead you to another uh, platform. Um, It's it's one of those ones that it's quick and easy. But we'd love love for you to navigate the website. It tells our story as a family, but then there's there's two pages on there that actually um, tell you all about the walk tell you all about what our purpose is of the walk has great videos and pictures and things like that. So if you want to, if you want to join and, and watch along, if you want to go, all you have to do is type in the T H E four, four, four guy G Y G U Y on all the socials. That'll lead you to my um, personal pages and you can follow along. I do videos. I do live events. Uh, I take funny pictures. I do a lot of nature stuff. Um, just everything I could do to share. I have a, uh, I have a Garmin map and you can kind of follow along with me. Um, that's also on the website. So you could click on there and see where I'm at at any moment during the day. So that's, you know, that's kind of a cool uh, piece to that. And then I have people call me and text me while I'm on the trace, um, you know, send me pictures of anything 444 that they might come across. And then our other big, uh, you know, donation pitch is, if you want to wear a great looking hat like Jim's wearing right now, you can get those on the website too. It's a $30 donation just this month. And we'd love for you not only to, you know, to support us, but if you can wear the hat and, and have a conversation with someone and, and tell them what exactly the hat means and what it's for, um, that would be much appreciated. You know what you've gone and done? You did this once and then you got these texts and now you're doing it twice. And now you're building even more momentum. So we might be seeing you next spring, Brad. I, I think you will. I think you will. Well, thank you so much for taking time out. I mean, you're, you're doing a lot of work there. So giving us time on the trail, uh, it's been great. And thank you for the work you're doing and spending time with us. Okay, perfect, Jim. And I just want to say one more thing before I go, um, just to share that, that emotional side of, of being a man. Uh, this year, I actually have my mom on the trip with me. And I, you know, I just want to give a big shout out to her because once again, if you don't have that person to pick you up and drop you off, the trip never happens. So I love you, mom. Thank you so much. And, you know, Jacob actually joined me on the first mile this year. So we made it into a big family event this year. And then, you know, my wife's bringing the other kids next week to meet up with me. So it's just, it's just a different, you know, like, you know, we're building on last year. And then, like you said, next year, 
I hope we have a, you know, a caravan of people, uh, maybe a whole production crew, who knows, you know, what the next steps will be. That's fantastic. Well, for our listeners, we appreciate you. Like we said, we know you got a lot of choices when it comes to podcasts. Appreciate you listening in. We'd love your help getting this podcast in the ears of more people who could listen to it. So go to our Facebook page and like us, uh, follow the show there, uh, go to YouTube and subscribe, and please share this with other parents, especially parents of kids with special needs, other folks who work in the world of supporting those with special needs. The more listeners, the more we can do a little bit of education. I think you'll agree after today, a little bit of inspiration and build a bigger community. So until next time, we'll see you then. Thanks, everybody.